Scripture reading before the lesson will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. <clears throat> now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by both those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this to each one of you. Now I say this, each one of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone sh uh, should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus besides. I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with, words, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Among any group of people, you're going to have some differences. And as I look around, I see some different faces. We all look a little different. And you listen to the singing. Not everyone sounds the same. We all sing a little differently. And I don't mean that in a bad way. There are differences among us. And know this, not all differences are bad, but some of them are. And when you think of the New Testament church, we have to think of the New Testament church as being one unified body. It has to. It has to be that way. If the Lord's church is not unified in togetherness, oneness, sameness, then we're divided. Once upon a time, I was a young man, hard to believe, before I had gray hair. And the church of Christ was not the religion of my youth. And I was converted out of denominationalism. Well, as with many other people who have been converted out of denominationalism, I was on fire. And I thought I would help do something with my uncle, who is my mother's brother. And once upon a time, he sent me a letter. And I'm going to read you some of this letter, and there's a reason behind this. And the reason is this. People watch us. And the perception that we give the world will either help us or hinder us in evangelism. Let me read you just some choice excerpts. These people, now that's the church of Christ, cannot get along among themselves. There are five, and this is what he refers to the church of Christ as, anti-churches in Johnson City that I know of, and only two of them will fellowship each other. Let me continue on here. The non-instrumental so-called Church of Christ is unquestionably the most divisive organization that God has ever permitted to exist. Now you take that. You think of that. Is this a gospel? No, it's not the gospel. This is one man's perception. And the way that we present ourselves sometimes is reality. The fact that there are at least Fifty-five divisions among them is proof of this. They have divided over such weighty matters as whether or not to use one cup or many cups in the Lord's Supper. Whether it is scriptural or not to have Sunday Bible school. Whether institutions such as children's homes should be overseen by one congregation or a group. Pre- and post-millennialism and whether or not church buildings should be built with an upper story since Jesus and his disciples took the Last Supper in the upper room. Each will call the others a splinter group. The reality is, however, that where there is a chance to divide, they will divide. Is that true? Now, why would I read that? Why would I read that? I'll tell you why. Because people are watching us. And sometimes perception is reality. What is the word on the street about the Lexington Church of Christ? Would you like to know? 
Maybe I'll tell you one day. Maybe I won't. Would you like to know? Think, brethren. We've been here a while. Do we exude love and unity? When people hear Church of Christ, they say, oh man, those people love themselves. Or do they say, that's the most divisive bunch I've ever met in my life. When you talk about the New Testament church, you have to talk about unity. So today, we're going to continue speaking of the New Testament church, but we're going to speak from the aspect of unity, oneness, sameness, togetherness, being bound together. If you have not, open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One of the best ways, I think, to preach about unity is to preach against division. Now, that may seem kind of odd, but that's exactly what Paul did. Paul preached unity by condemning division. Now, there are three things, three A's, which we're going to talk about today. The first one is there must be a unity in attitude. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 and 11, let me say this, and you'll hear it more than once. A contentious spirit kills. If you want to be a fault finder, it's easy. It's easy. The difficult thing to do is to find unity. See what the basis of unity is and stay there. The second thing is unity in action. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 to 16. Let me say this again. A contentious spirit kills. If you want to find a reason to fight, you can find it. A contentious disposition will murder the church. And number three. Unity in authority in 1 Corinthians 1.17. One more time. A contentious spirit kills. You remember Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. Six things the Lord hates. Seven that he finds abomination. When you look at that, the last one. He that soweth discord amongst brethren. Now let me state this from the outset. There are things that we have to fight about. There are things we have to fight about. We cannot allow false doctrine. We cannot allow sinfulness. We cannot allow those things. But everything in the world is not sinful. Everything in the world is not false doctrine. We have to be wise enough to understand that. And where there is realm for judgment or realm for opinion, let it go. In that letter I read some of those things which my uncle, Claimed to be weighty matters. Some of them are. But some of them are judgment calls. And when we fight over judgment calls, the world watches. And they can see. There's no reason to fight about every single thing in the world. Brethren, what are we going to do? Point number one. There has to be unity in attitude. One more time. A contentious spirit kills. Let's see what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 10. Now I beseech you. The word beseech here brings with it the idea of beg. Paul is begging. Now he had authority as an apostle to say, I command you. But he says, I beseech you, brethren, those who were bound together by the blood of Christ, by the name, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Now watch. And that there be no divisions, that word is translated as schism, separation in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be, next three words are all one word in Greek, perfectly joined together. I found it interesting. In Matthew 4, 21 and Mark 1, 19, this word is translated as mending in regard to a fisherman's nets. Now think of this. What good is a fisherman's net that won't hold fish? What if he goes to fish with his net and there's a big gaping hole in it? And every time he goes to grab a fish, it swims right back on it. In the same principle, what good is a church with a big gaping hole in it? Because we're not perfectly joined together. What good will we do? The same good that a fisherman's net with a big hole in it will do with catching fish. We won't accomplish anything that we're supposed to. But that you be perfectly joined together. Key in the same mind. That's attitude. When you look at this word, the mind is where we understand. And this word is often translated as understanding. That you be in the same understanding. Where do we understand things? In our minds. Be 
of the same mind, but he doesn't stop there, does he? He says, and in the same judgment. Interesting word. The word is translated as advice in 2 Corinthians 8.10. And my four lexicons that I search to find the meaning of Greek words, for example, all four of them are in unison in agreeing that this word here means opinion. Do you understand that? Not only are we to be, speak the same thing doctrinally, we ought to speak the same thing even in matters of opinion. Can that happen? I am totally convinced most of the reason the churches of Christ divide, split, and everything else is over judgment calls. Yes, false doctrine comes in. Yes, there are things that have to be opposed. But many times people get their feelings hurt over judgment matters. What is a judgment? It is a matter of opinion. Key phrase. Gospel is not opinion. But now reverse that. Opinion is not gospel. Where there is wiggle room, let it go. Do you see the wisdom in God commanding Paul to Titus to set things in order and ordain elders in every city? Let the eldership rule in matters of judgment. That's part of what they do. And when the elders make a judgment call, drop it. It's done. It's over with. They have done their God-ordained duty. But many times it doesn't happen that way, does it? It doesn't happen that way. Why? Because we're not of the same mind. And because we're not of the same judgment. Verse 11 we'll see here is the reason behind Paul's statement, inspired statement that is, in verse 10, 4. Here's why I said this. Here's why Paul lays it down. Remember, they had a lot of problems in Corinth. A lot of doctrinal problems, but they also had problems in the realm of judgment of the things that at the end of the day don't amount to a hill of beans. You can do it this way. You can do it that way. It doesn't matter. But someone has to make the judgment, and when it is done, it's done. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren. Now, Paul didn't have any problem calling names, did he? Paul didn't have any problem saying, now y'all got a problem and I'm going to tell you where it came from. Did Paul have a problem with that? Absolutely not. It hath been declared unto me, you, the church of Christ at Corinth, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, you will rack your brain to death. Were those members of the church? <laughs> you'll have a hard time establishing that. It could very well be that they were, and most likely they were. What if they were just regular visitors? What if they were just regular visitors to the assembly and saw the foolishness which went on in the assemblies? Now, my opinion is they probably were members of the church. I can't bind that as a law. Do you understand it could very well be that these were non-members of the church who saw the foolishness anyway and let Paul know, it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions, debate and strife. And that, doesn't that sound like the Lord's unified body right there? Doesn't that sound like the Lord's unified body here we are, members of the church, assembled together to worship and we're fighting like dogs. Isn't that scriptural? Isn't that scriptural? Isn't that the way the Lord's people are supposed to be? Are we not the most divisive organization on the planet? No, we are not. But if we give that perception, it is reality to some people. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35? A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another by this. By what? Your debate and strife? By your quarreling over petty garbage? By this. By your fervent love one for another shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love 
one to another. Is that the word on the street about the election in the church of Christ? That we have fervent love to all people, especially one another? Ask and see. Ask and see. Call around. Ask. Ask and see. It ought to be this way. There must be unity in attitude. When we understand this, Paul is not teaching. Paul is not teaching that error cannot or should not be opposed. It has to be opposed. But everything is not error. Everything is not going to send you to hell. There are some matters of judgment that we got to let alone. Let it be. Let it go. And especially with an eldership, when the eldership says, here's how we're going to do it, that's it. Be done with it. Anything from there will cause contention and strife. Let it go. When we understand it is the obligation of every single member of the church to seek unity. That's my individual responsibility is to seek peace, to seek unity, not in sin or error or wrongdoing. I hope you understand that. But we're all different. You don't look like me. Thank God for you. You don't talk like me more than likely. That's another blessing for you. It's stacking up in your favor quick. You don't act like me. Your disposition's not like me, and that's okay. But we have to be together. We have to be together, or we will die. We will die apart. I've illustrated it many times. You've built a fire. You've built a fire. Oftentimes what happens when you kick that one log out there by itself? Does it start a whole other forest fire? No, it burns out. We need each other, brethren. It's got to be there. Can this be achieved? Can we have unity and attitude that is our mindset? Yes. What's the key? Philippians 2, 5 and following. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was found in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How are we going to be unified when somebody has the mind of Christ and someone else has the mind of the devil? It won't happen. First thing we've talked about is unity in attitude. Now, let's talk about unity in action. In 1 Corinthians 1, 12 to 16, that is, one more time, a contentious spirit kills. Verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, that's Peter, by the way, and I have Christ. It seems as though they were lining themselves up with their favorite preacher. It could be even from this context that these were the individuals who they obeyed the gospel under their preaching. It could be that some heard Paul preaching and obeyed the gospel. It could be, as you'll see down, that Paul was actually the one to baptize them. But we'll see Christ didn't baptize people as far as put them under the water. But his teaching did cause many people to be baptized under John's baptism. Is verse 13 Christ divided? The answer is no. He is not divided. Was Paul crucified for you? The answer is no, he wasn't. Or were you baptized in the name that's by the authority of Paul? The answer is no. Then why are there divisions? I thank God, verse 14, that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. It seems that many of the church of Christ at Corinth had aligned themselves with their favorite preacher. That is, I like the way Paul preaches, so I'm a Paul. What's the difference between Paul and Apollos? You can make the case that Apollos was an inspired man too. What inspired men in the first century preached different gospels? None. Now, there's nothing wrong with liking Paul. There's nothing wrong with liking Apollos. There's nothing wrong with those things. But to say Paul is better, you better watch out. You're causing strife where there doesn't need to be any strife. All these men preach the same truth. When you understand that the church even today Pretty much when you look at the work of the church, it's threefold, evangelism, edification, and benevolence. I would say that by and large, when you consider the aspect of baptism, 
Most churches of Christ are sound on evangelism or baptism. Now, that doesn't mean all, but most. That is, we all understand baptism is required in order to be saved. That baptism is immersion, total overwhelming in water, by the authority of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. Now, I think we all understand that, but how much farther do we want to go? We preached on this. Do we have to bind running water? What about fresh water? Salt water? Pond water? Do you understand? The problem is when we're unified in action, we understand what's important. Baptism for the right reasons to be added to the right church is important. Running water is irrelevant. Pond water is irrelevant. Fresh water, salt water is irrelevant. And we oftentimes can't see that. Just as these brethren evidently in the first century, it didn't matter who put you under the water. It still doesn't matter, really. What matters is the reason. Why are you baptized? Why were you baptized 20 years ago? I'd say many of us can't even remember. Don't even know what day of the month it was or even what month it was. How long have you been a child of God? Remember your birthday? Remember your anniversary? Better remember your wife's birthday. You get in trouble, hot water for that. How about the day you were converted? Brethren, we have to be unified in action. Now, let's talk about this quickly. In understanding this, all these people were immersed. All these people were scripturally immersed, but they went a little farther, it seems, in saying that who baptized them or who the preacher was when they obeyed was better. Well, you had Peter, I had Christ. Well, you had Apostle, well, I had Paul. You're making a big deal about nothing. That's nothing to have any real pride in. They're all, for example, inspired men. They all preach the same truth. Let it go. You were added by the same Lord to the same church. What does it matter? Now, think of this. What about edification? Many errors in the church have come in the aspect of edification. Worship is edification. You do realize that. Building up. This is a place to get built up. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs, preaching, praying, those kind of things. Now, some have said, well, we'll just enter this into the worship. Well, you don't have any authorization for that. Now, when you try to take opinion and make it gospel, you're in trouble. But when you try to turn the gospel and make it into opinion, you're in just as much trouble. But let's think specifically about this. The avenue of benevolence. In James 1.27, the obligation is laid out. That is, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That word visit doesn't mean go see. It means to meet the needs of. Question. How can you meet the needs of a widow? Can you give them a check? Put Bible on it. You understand? How can you meet the needs of an orphan? Can you take them into your home? Put Bible on. Understand what I'm saying. The obligation is set out. Now, you'll drive yourself crazy figuring out the how. You can write a check. You can take them into your home. To say that there is an exclusive pattern in the action of benevolence, watch out. Watch out. What if you want to give them cash? Put a Bible verse on it. You won't. God has given us the obligation, but he hasn't told us the how. Therefore, it is in the realm of judgment. Who makes the judgment calls in every scriptural congregation? The eldership. So if the elders say we find the most expedient way to meet the needs of fatherless and widows is to write a check to this place who we know is okay, then it's done. There's nothing else to say. Why would we divide and fight over writing a check? Why? I don't know. But sometimes we will. Brethren, we have to be unified in action. Now, let's go on to number three. First one was unity and attitude. That is, our mind has to be on the same page. Even in the realm of opinion. It has to be on the same page. We can be there and understand faith from opinion. The second thing we talked about is unity in action. 
There are some things where there is no wiggle room. But there are other things where there are. Baptism is no wiggle room in the action. It has to be immersion. It cannot be sprinkling or pouring. But does it have to be running water, salt water? That's a, that's a judgment call. Can it be in the baptistry? Yes. Why? Because it is in the realm of judgment. The same thing with benevolence. Find a specific pattern for benevolence. Good luck. Good luck. You'll drive yourself nuts. And you'll cause problems where there need to be none. Now, number three, there has to be unity and authority. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. The key words, the first, the first four words are the key to this verse. For Christ sent me. That's the key in understanding that verse. For reason, Christ sent me. Paul was baptized within of whatever the Holy Spirit and as an apostle, his primary duty was to preach the word. Why? Because he was an inspired man. And as such, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, he had access to, if the Bible teaches this, all nine spiritual gifts, one of which was diverse tongues. That means Paul could go up to any person that spoke any language and preach the gospel. Not everybody could do that. Anybody could baptize, but not everyone, especially in the first century, could preach the gospel because they were not all inspired. For Christ sent me not to baptize. You could also look at that as not only to baptize. Why? Because you just read he did baptize people. He did actually put people under the water. Not only, for example, to baptize, but also, and really more importantly, to preach the gospel. Why? Because he had the work of an apostle. The work of an apostle was not just to put people under the water. Anyone could do that. Not anyone could preach the unrevealed revelation from God in the first century. You had to have an inspired man. The apostles of Christ were inspired men and nothing hindered them to preach to any person anywhere at any time. Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. When we understand this, unity in attitude and unity in action is made possible only through having unity in authority. Did he say Moses sent me? He didn't say Moses sent him. Did he say Elijah sent me? Nope, Elijah didn't send him either. Who sent him? The authoritative lawgiver of the new covenant. Jesus Christ. Christ sent me Paul. That's the key to that verse. Paul recognized Christ has all authority. Do you remember what Jesus said? In Matthew 28 beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying... All power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Do we see who has all authority? Qualify that with 1 Corinthians 15, the Father being accepted. Christ sent Paul. There is the unity in authority. We have to be united in the new covenant. There are people today who still want to bind the old covenant and keep the Sabbath and everything else. You can't be unified with that. You can't have that. We don't have the same standard. There are people today that say tradition is more binding than the Bible. You can't have unity with that. Do you understand? But when we, even the church, recognize Christ is the authority why can we not have unity? Well, we can. What about John 16, 13? You realize that's an apostolic promise? What do you mean by that, Brock? If I were to assign you that, say, I want you to write 50 words and explain to me John 16, 13. Somebody, I'm sure, would say that means something to me. Man, that's an apostolic promise. You're not going to be guided into all truth miraculously by the Holy Spirit. You can read all truth. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into almost all truth. No, he said all truth. 
And he will show you things to come, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. That's an apostolic promise. What did those apostles do and prophets? They wrote. So to say the Holy Spirit, to pray for the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth is a vain prayer. The truth has already been revealed. Read it, apply it, and understand it. What about 1 Corinthians 14, 37? Do we have the same standard of authority? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I, Paul, write unto you are the commandments of Moses, the commandments of Elijah, the commandments of the Lord. Who's the Lord? Jesus Christ. Now, will we have unity and attitude? Not if we have a contentious spirit. It won't happen. If you want to be a fault finder and find fault with the preacher, guess what? Boy, I'm an open book. You can point out my flaws all day long. You haven't really accomplished anything when you do that. What about unity and action? Where we understand there are some things where there's no wiggle room, but there are some things where there is wiggle room. Let it wiggle. And, but when the elders, for example, make a decision, let it go. Let it go. What about unity and authority? Can we be unified in authority? Yes, we can. We will be unified in doctrine and even in opinion. Or we will give our enemies the opportunity they need. We'll give our enemies, those who despise the church, those who look at us as the most divisive organization on the planet. If we can't get along, all we're doing is keeping them lost. You understand that? If we can't speak the same thing and get out here and do what we're supposed to do, what are we doing? What are we doing? Making ourselves feel good about nothing? Rather than our Lord came to seek and save the lost. That is part of the work of the church. We have to seek and save the lost. People are going to complain sometimes no matter what. But we can't give them the ammunition with which to shoot us. We cannot give them the ammunition with which to shoot us with. In Ephesians 4, 4-6. to six, There you have it. Let me give you the grounds here. There are seven ones right there. There is one body. That means there's one church. You understand that? The Lord paid for one church. He named that church. When you look at it, now there are several different names it could go by. But one of those scriptural names is Church of Christ. There is one body and one spirit. That is, when we understand that, there is unity in our guidance. We're not just left as orphan children to wander around. There is the New Testament to guide us and to direct us. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your call. That's unity of aspiration. What do you aspire to? Have a lot of money? That's not the church's aspiration. Our goal is heaven. We want to go to heaven. Now, and if we don't have the same goal of heaven, somebody needs to leave. And if I stop desiring heaven, I need to leave. Because that's what we have to aspire to have. One body, one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord. Unity of authority. One faith. Do we understand that? There is unity in teaching. One baptism. That one baptism which remains is immersion in water for the remission of sins. In order to be saved. Not because you're saved, but in order to be saved. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. That shows unity of worship. Will we be unified? Will you allow the Lord to add you to his unified body? The choice is yours. What do you choose? Choose the Lord's way. It's the easy way. Choose unity. It's easy. Do so now. As together we stand. And as we sing the song of encouragement. Care the soul.